Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, not bad. Not bad. Let's try it again, though. Good morning. It is great to see you guys this morning. What a blessing. Ernie, I'm even glad to see you. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, just so you know, people, um, <clears throat> I told them uh, uh, they were glad to see you. They're glad you're playing piano. Diane uh, uh, Listy said it was so good to see you playing today. And praise the Lord there. Somebody said hi to Bigfoot. I have no idea what that means, but that's what they said. I, I have no idea. And then somebody apparently is talking about their freezer or something. There's just random comers. It's just like church. Just randomly talking about stuff. So, and, uh, uh, but people were wishing their love to Rodney and wishing their love to you and nobody. Just saying that they just, they're used to me. It's okay. But I'm glad to, <laughs> no, don't feel bad. Just kidding. I really am teasing. So I am glad to see you. We've got a rumble. Do you hear that? That was weird. By the way, I had to turn down the speaker out there. It was actually distorted. It was so loud. But our folks are out in the parking lot. And if you're out in the parking lot, we are glad you're out there. And we just want to say hi to you. And those of you watching online, we're glad you're here. So um, today we're going to talk about seeing the big picture. And the truth is, you and I see just a very small part of life. And the other thing we do, we tend to see it from our perspective. Um, how we grew up, what we know, what we see, yet God sees everything, and he knows your future, and he knows how he can work out what's happening in your life, and for the last six weeks, we've been talking about this idea of you'll get through this. Uh, the idea comes from the story of Joseph, and then Max Lucado wrote a book about it, um, but the truth is that in your life and in my life, we need to realize what God sees in our future. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at three things that God sees in your future. And let me tell you something I know about people. We don't change until pain is greater than our comfort. We don't change until pain is greater than our comfort. Let me tell you how that works. I remember one night I was sitting at home minding my own business when all of a sudden I had this twinge of pain right here. It started out as a twinge. And anybody who's had this twinge of pain right about here knows what I'm talking about. Others of you are like, hmm, it's a mystery. I have no idea. But I knew what was going on because I had had them before. It was the beginning of kidney stones. And so one of the things I know about kidney stones is you've got to hydrate. Not only hydrate if you can uh, add lemon juice or something that will make you hydrate more and less. All at the same time, you're doing really well. And so I sent my son to the store, and I, and I don't drink, by the way, and I sent him to the store, and I said, would you get me a six-pack of O'Doul's? Now, if you don't know what O'Doul's is, think of the worst thing you have ever put in your mouth and multiply that times five. And I drank all six in about an hour. And here's why. Because I was in so much pain, I did not care. I thought... If I can drink these six horrible things, then just maybe. But nay, nay. It did not work. It just made it worse and worse and worse. And finally, I got to the point that I said to my son, you're driving me to the hospital. He said, what? Now, let me tell you why he said what. Because I don't let other people drive if I can help it. If you don't know that about me yet, you've not hung around me enough. Because I know that I'm the best driver and you're not. That's not really true, but I, I just like to drive, and I actually get motion sick in the passenger seat. I, I, listen, I get sick driving. I actually got a bus driver's license so I could drive the bus so nobody else had to drive. That's how bad it is. But yet I said, son, you drive me to the hospital. So he drives me to the hospital. I get to the hospital, and I go into the ER, and as I'm in the ER, a nurse that goes to our church comes in to talk to me. As she's talking to me, I'm doing what I do when I'm in pain, which is crack jokes. Another nurse comes in and says, oh, you've already given him the pain medicine. She said, no, this is just how my pastor is all the time. And then she gave me the pain medicine. Oh, it was wonderful. I went from being in the worst pain of my life to not caring. I said, this is a good time. If you want to cut my hand off right now, this would be a good time to do it. And then the nurse came in that had been there before and said, you're exactly like you are all the time. I said, yeah, that's really true. 
I was not going to go to the hospital till I was in so much pain I couldn't stand it. Listen, you and I oftentimes do not change until something forces us to change, whether it's a trial or a struggle or a, something that the doctor tells us or something with a family member or a loss of job. We tend to just do what we do and we settle in until God allows something in our lives to change us. Now, I don't know when you look at the story of Joseph, what stage of his story you're in. Maybe you're in the time where everything's going well and everybody loves you and dad just gave you a coat of many colors. woo -hoo! Or maybe your brothers hate your guts. That's coming. Or maybe you've been thrown into a pit. Maybe you were accused falsely and have gone through that time. Some of you have already been through those things. You relate. Maybe you came out of that first pit and thought, well, I'll never have another one. And then you were thrown in jail, right? Joseph's thrown in jail. Maybe not physical jail, but maybe somebody falsely accused you again. And his story continues and God continues to work in his life. And I want you to know God will use difficulties in your life. He'll use them sometimes to break us of our pride and our selfishness. He'll help us to realize that we're not perfect. And he also helps us to learn how to forgive. So that we can change and really become focused on him Instead of the people around us. So let's look at those three things today. Number one, God uses pain or discomfort for the good. We're going to pick up in Genesis 37. And what I'm going to do today, because this is the end of the series, is we're going to kind of recap the story of Joseph by talking about the beginning and end and pulling those together so you can see how God already knew. Joseph had a dream. By the way, at this time, he was about 17 years of age. It was about 20 years until he saw his brothers again. 20-something years. Somebody think, some think 25 and when he told his brothers, they hated him. Listen to this. All the more. They already hated him. So, so these were half-brothers. These were brothers, same dad, different mom. There were only two brothers that had the same mom. He and his youngest brother, Ben. And he said to them, listen to this dream I have. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. I don't know why his brothers were aggravated by him. Can you, <laughs> Can you imagine? But you know, he's a kid. You know, I don't know if you know what you were like at 17. Can I give you a hint? Because I did college ministry for years. You know everything. If you haven't talked to a college kid lately, they're smarter than you are. You know what college teaches you? How smart you're not. Usually by the time somebody gets about their senior year of college, they start to realize, I don't know as much as I thought I knew. But that beginning of college where they're finding themselves, they start to think they know things. You've got to let your kids and your grandkids go through that time of no all-knowingness. So hopefully, now by, by the way, we all have friends who never got out of that, right? Don't we all know somebody who they're still in the second year of college, even though they're 73 years old, right? Because they know it all. So he says, yeah, you bowed down to it. And his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? To which you could see Joseph going, well, yeah. And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. God is going to use this discomfort, this pain. Now, I don't know. I've got three ingredients up here. I love to make calzones. Anybody in here like calzones? Anybody watching online like calzones? Anybody in the parking lot like calzones? Okay, never mind. So, so here's the thing. All of these ingredients, there's, there's, I like rapid yeast. I don't know why. It's just, I don't know. It's usually all you can find lately, right? A little salt, some flour. You might throw a few other ingredients in there, but really, if you have these three and some water, you, you can make calzone bread. Get it ready to go. Now, let me tell you about these. I would never, and I actually had somebody tell me this week that they like the smell of yeast, so they thought, I bet you it tastes good. No. Nay, nay. <laughs> how about if I just picked this up and dumped flour in my mouth right now? How, how many think that would go well? No, right? How many think that would go poorly? You think that would go, yeah, right? And salt. I taught one of my kids this week about gargling salt when your throat's bothering you. They said, that is disgusting. 
And just like my parents said, that's why it works. You would never do these, but you combine these and you put the water in there. And I've let that bread go all day long. My kids come in and go, something smells good. Is it calzone night? Oh, <laughs> you are correct. And if you behave, you will have calzones. Father, what is it you need me to do for you? I'd like you to clean out the dishwasher. The dishwasher will be cleaned right away if the calzone is going to be today. It's amazing. But all of these separately are awful. Listen, you're going to have salt moments in your life. By the way, Jesus actually calls us the salt of the earth. I'm not sure if that's a blessing or a curse, but we're needed. You're going to have flower moments in your life where you feel like you just can't handle any more. You're going to have the moments where it seems like life is in turmoil and bubbling and stinky. But when God puts all of those ingredients together in your life, if, if you will allow him to let you rise to what he has next for you. You don't have to, by the way. You can stop right here. Sick of all this. Joseph could have had his brothers hate him and said, ah, I'm not talking about that anymore. I'm done. Listen to what happens next. By the way, James 1.3 says that there's trials. There's going to be trials. The idea in there is that they sneak up on you. By the way, nobody planned a trial. Nobody woke up this morning and said, you know what? I would love it if I... You know what? I'm just going to drive a nail into my hand this afternoon. No. I've done it. We, we've all had accidents. I fell out of a tree one time, right? You, you've had things happen. You've had somebody come. You didn't say to man, I hope my friend attacks me today and says something really rude to me. No, those things come. But the Bible says to allow it. In verse 4, James says, allow it to do its work in you. Allow the yeast to rise. Allow God to use all those bitter things to make you better. Joseph, at the end of the story in Genesis 45, says this, But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance, so that, excuse me, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Would you say, but God with me? Ready? One, two, three. But God. Let's do it one more time. Ready? One, two, three. But God. Listen. When something happens in your life, here's what we tend to do. But God, I don't want to go through that trial. I don't want to be in the hospital. I don't want to have that person I love hurting. I don't want to lose that loved one. I don't want to deal with that situation. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to. But God. And then when you say, when you pray, you say, but God. I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But God, I know that you will help me to walk through this valley of the shadow of death and you will be with me. But God, I know that regardless of what happens in my life, one day I will be face to face with you. But God. And when you allow that but God moment to come into your life, you realize that those attacks that seem like they're from the enemy are the very things that God will use to make you who he wants you to be, to prepare you for what he has next to you. It's calzone night, kids. Are you going to get a calzone today? He had to buy a Reuben sandwich after I talked about Reuben the other day. And then he said, he made me father to Pharaoh. Now, how's that for bragging? Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. By the way, if you go back to Genesis chapter 15, Abraham was told 400 years before this that this was going to happen. You think God didn't know what was going on? He was told they would be, go into a land and then be taken captive. He knew way back in Abraham's time. So you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now his son, Joseph. And now the prophecy from years before is coming true. God is doing amazing things. By the way, the 400 years before the end of the Egyptian travels. And so 76 family members of Joseph moved to Egypt. It was a pretty good start. Here's your first challenge. God, 
in your first prayer. God, turn pain and discomfort into understanding. So you have a choice in this world when you deal with something you don't like, when somebody gives you an opinion you don't like, when you deal with a situation you don't want to deal with, you can become bitter and hard and fight against it. Or you can say, God, I want to learn what you want me to learn. God, you can use even this difficult thing for your good. What are you teaching me? And allow him to give you that but God moment to show you that what you're experiencing is no different than what people have experienced in the past. And he will give you strength to walk through it. Max Lucado says it this way. You'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. In the meantime, don't be foolish or naive. But don't despair either. With God's help, you'll get through this. Number two. God uses the broken and the less than. Listen, do you ever feel like a failure? Do you ever feel like you don't have gifts God can use? I want you to know you can be used by God if you'll let him. See, many people think, but Eric, I'm not like you. I'm an introvert. My son's an introvert. He's going to hate going back to the office. But God uses him as a blessing everywhere he goes. You do not have to be like me, thank God. Some of you are like, thank God for that. Hey. Did you know they talk about natural pearls? The reason they form is because of an irritant. But did you know it's more than just an irritant? Most of the time it's a parasite. The pearl, the the shell, the clam was actually under attack. And that attack is what formed the pearl. Listen, you may have been attacked in your life. Listen to Joseph's story. When Joseph saw his father, and his father by the name was named Jacob. Placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. What in the world are we talking about? Where are we going in this story? Let me tell you what's happening. So Joseph's dad, this guy Jacob, is about to die. Now Jacob, you might remember by the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the one who who was sold the birthright by his brother. Remember? Esau sold him his birthright. Even though Esau was the older brother, Jacob was the younger brother. And Jacob got the blessing. He tricked his dad into the blessing. Sounds like deception runs in this family. And so here... Joseph brings his children, Manasseh the oldest and Ephraim, and he puts them up. And his dad, the right hand is supposed to go on the oldest child. And his dad goes like this. And Joseph's like, Dad, you're messing up. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh. He's the oldest. Joseph said, no, my father, this one's the firstborn. Put your right hand on his. Give him the first blessing, basically. He says, I know, my son, I know he too will become a great people and he'll become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, in your name, we're Israel. And that's where we get the name Jacob. Pronounce this blessing. May God make you. Now, listen to this. Ephraim, like Ephraim and Manasseh, not like Manasseh and Ephraim. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. And the rest of the time, all through the Bible, the younger brother is named first. The lesser brother is named first. The one who was lesser was made greater because that's what God does. Joseph's children had two tribes. They they each got a half tribe, essentially. There's basically 13 names of tribes, if you didn't know that. But, But each of these, Ephraim and Manasseh, and all through the Bible, even in the New Testament, they say Ephraim and Manasseh. Why? 1 Corinthians 127 says it this way. But God chose the foolish things of this world. Been there. You ever done something dumb? Foolish change of this world, things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. See, the people who think they have their act together are not ready for God to use them. But if you're beginning to say, God, I'm broken. I'm messed up. I failed. But I know you can use me. If you can allow that but God moment to be God, I don't know why you would use me. But you can. He will use the weak things, the broken things. Those difficulties you've been through in your life are the very things that God will use to bless someone else. This morning, I got a note from somebody who went through terrible grief. And now they use that grief to teach other people how to walk through grief. 
Have you gone through something tragic? Have you gone through something terrible? Have you failed and fallen? That fall may be the very thing that God can use to help you to help others. Joseph knew all about forgiveness and he knew all about leadership. Why? Because he had been through it. Here's your second prayer. Help me to honor broken people, including me. Now, here's why I say that. I know our church members. You're very good at looking at other people and going, yeah, they're messed up. They're not perfect. God bless them. But you may have a hard time looking in the mirror and saying, God, you can use me. Give yourself the grace that God would give you. And for some of you, I would say, if you would give yourself the grace that you give other people, it would change your life. God can use that broken and blessed then, even if it's you. Number three, forgiveness brings blessings. And let me tell you why you have to forgive. Because you're with people. See, Jesus gave two commands, love God and love people, right? Now, here's the problem. People. God, I can love, you know, I, God, I love you. I, you know, I know you love me. You care about me. You're going to walk me through this dark time. But those people are messed up. And the truth is, sometimes, have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, well, I had thought I wasn't going to eat anymore. You had to put a sign on the refrigerator that said, stay away. You're quarantined from the fridge. And the next thing you know, you're in the middle of eating something. You ever been in the car, got something through a drive through and then reached in the bag and realized you didn't even know you ate? I've eaten all the fries before I've gotten out of the McDonald's parking lot before. Now, you don't even want to know what that looks like. And I'm so disappointed in me. But God says you can even forgive you. Because I've forgiven you. You can forgive that other person. Why? Because I've forgiven you. Now let me not mix up what forgiveness is. Let me read this first. So Joseph basically accepts his brothers. Gives them a place to live. The dad comes. They're, they're living in luxury. They've got the finest of the land. They've got everything they need and want. And then his dad dies. And the brothers have a conversation that goes like this. You know what? Joseph was just keeping us around until dad died. Now he's going to kill us all. So then the liars send a message to Joseph that said, Dad doesn't want you to kill us. And here's what happened. When the message came to him, Genesis 50, 17, Joseph wept. I love Joseph. Joseph cries over and over in this passage. He cries when he hears that one of his brothers fought for him. And didn't, they didn't all hate him. He cries when he sees his brothers. He, he cries when he reveals himself to his brothers. And here he cries again because he can't believe his brothers can't believe that they're forgiven. By the way, Jesus does the same thing to us sometimes. His brothers came and threw themselves at before him. We're your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Listen to this. You intended to harm me. This is what forgiveness is. Joseph doesn't make less of what they've done. Forgiveness is not saying that what happened to you is okay. Forgiveness is not even saying what you've done is okay. It's not lessening the sin. But it's releasing the debt. That person that hurts you no longer owes you. Now, don't mistake this. This doesn't mean you have to have a relationship with an abusive or hurtful person. It doesn't mean that you need to stay in business with somebody who continually does things that are wrong. It doesn't mean that you have to stay close to somebody just because you love them does not mean you have to hang around them. And with some people, you can't. But you release them. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. God changes the trajectory of our pain. To accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. I believe that Joseph forgave over and over and over. When I was being dragged off to a land I'd never been to, with a language I'd never been to, and I thought of what my brother's done, I'm sure I would have gripped my teeth. Remember, the battle is mainly up here. 
His battle was with his brothers initially, but the truth is now he had to decide what to do with it. Listen, you think you're fighting with a person, but the enemy is fighting you having that conversation afterwards. You ever do that? By the way, we're awesome movie producers. I should have said this, and you have a whole movie of what that would have looked like. Let me tell you how bad I am. This is how evil your pastor is. I'm very passive aggressive, which is a horrible trait, and I really work on it. I ask God to forgive me, and I ask him to help me not to do it. I do it especially when I'm driving. You drive with your blinker on and I pass you, I might pull in front of you and turn my blinker on just to be a doofus. You tailgate me, oh, there's a temptation to break. I got to admit, I want a sign that says I break for tailgaters, right? But I don't, I don't. God's working on me. But I had a dream the other night that I walked into the cafeteria and I had a big plate of french fries. I like french fries. I'm Irish. I'm sorry. And I had to go and get some ketchup, so I put the french fries down. I went to get ketchup, and when I came back, I was in the cafeteria, and there were all these guys sitting there laughing, and my fry plate was empty. And I looked over, and the cafeteria was out of french fries, and I looked at the guys, and I said, Hey, now this is a dream I had. I said, Hey, guys, where's my french fries? And they were eating my french fries and laughing. <laughs> and I said, Well, I don't know what happened to them. It's too bad, but I licked all of them. <laughs> I dream passive-aggressive dreams. I don't even know these guys. What kind of dreams do you dream when you're awake about people who've hurt you? About things that have happened to you? That's the battle. And this is where we need the peace of Christ that rules our minds, that helps us to forgive and love people who do not deserve it, who are jerks, who are totally opposed to what God does. If, if Paul could pray for Nero, who was skinning Christians alive, we can pray for those who've hurt us and persecuted us and injured us and treated us improperly and wrong. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says it this way. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, oh boy, oh my anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. The last challenge is this. Father, help me to walk in forgiveness. Now, at the end of your notes, there's a great prayer. And you can pray it this week. We're not going to pray it together. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I'll be here after the service. I can even walk outside. I know some people are more comfortable talking outside. That's probably smart. If you want to talk about what it means to be a Christian, you've never surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you, were, maybe you gave your life to Christ when you were a kid, but you've kind of walked away from that. Maybe right now you're struggling with unforgiveness. My prayer for you is you'd be able to take that next step, whatever it is. If you're not a Christian, that today you'd surrender your life to Christ. If you're a Christian, but you're walking in some unforgiveness, that you'd begin to take that person before God and say, God, I can't forgive them, but God, help me. And he'll help you on that journey, and we're glad to help too. You send me a note, an email, whatever. You can give online. If you're here, we have a box in the back you can give. We're not going to pass the offering plate, but thanks for being here today. I hope you've enjoyed this series, and I hope God uses it for you and for me to change our lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much that you use our hurts and our pains, that you use broken people and the difficulties in our lives. Lord, so often we're going through those flower moments, those times where life seems bitter. And Lord, I know you can use all things for good. But God, continue to work in our lives. But God, continue to use the hurts and pains to be a blessing. But God, continue to use our church to be a blessing to our community and the world. And Father, I pray as a church, no matter what people look like or act like, that we could learn how to love even those who are unlovely. Father, even those who are opposed to you. Father, in a world full of anger and frustration, I pray that we would be a world full of justice and change. And Lord, we'd be the ones that speak up for what's right. And Father, I pray too, for that one here or the one watching online that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. May we walk in your peace and be the light in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.